Welcome to Asian Times TV. Uh, we have with us today a very special guest, a historian named Peter Hees uh, from Pondicherry, India. Uh, this week, the Indian government refused to extend the visa of an American historian who has lived in India for the past 40 years on the grounds that he has overstayed his extension. The real issue playing out in the media was the controversy surrounding the book, The Lives of Sri Aurobindo, authored by Peter Hees, who has been a devotee and an archivist at the Aurobindo Ashram. He has produced a full-length biography of the varied personalities of a turn-of-the-century politician and poet who was once a revolutionary for Indian nationalism, later became a yogi and a renunciate, and according to some historians of religion, was perhaps India's greatest philosopher of the 20th century. So the latest controversy follows on the heels of similar public condemnations of books written by Western or liberal Indian thinkers who wish to interpret the lives of spiritual figures or the great Indian traditions and culture with a loving but a critical eye. Fueled partly by the rise of Hindutva, anything that smacks of blasphemy angers some faction of a political group or a cultural group uh, creating uproar in the media. So the question you know, we have with us today that we're dealing with is, after all, why would an early 20th century Indian mystic who fought for India's liberation from the British and then retreated into his French Indian hamlet in Pondicherry have any great significance today, especially as India embraces economic liberalization, double digit growth, and, and, and vying for a coveted seat on UN Security Council? And I think the, we're going to get the answers from Peter Heese, who's really one of the authorities on Aurobindo today. Um, and I think the answer may be that, and, and Peter can tell me whether this is right or wrong, uh, Aurobindo was the only nationalist figure uh, who, fought, who fought for the independence movement, who tackled the perennial spiritual question, questions of life and offered a spiritual evolution for all of humanity. So today, you know, we take a synthesis, a cultural synthesis of East and West, almost for granted, while doing yoga postures or sipping chai lattes or listening to world music. Uh, but during the colonial period, arousing such aspirations for universal ideals and values was not easily achieved. And Aurobindo almost took on the whole empire by himself uh, to find his corner of the earth, Pondicherry in South India, to live in freedom, and to offer a vision of a better, more integrated world uh, that was just on the horizon. So Peter, uh, welcome to this uh, new and exciting show. And you know, our, our mission here is to deal with emerging issues in Asia. And so this is clearly one of the issues uh, that, that we're, we're quite eager to take up. So uh, we welcome you to the show. And so tell us, what do, you, what do you think about what's going on with this controversy in your book? Well, there's a lot of things at play at the same time, and I find it very difficult to try to uh, summarize it uh, and bring out all of those at the same time. Uh, and just in your introduction there, you brought up so many that, um, could you maybe kind of focus it so that I can answer one specific thing rather than try to cover the whole thing at once? Just yeah, focus sure. on one so thing. Do you think Aurobindo was really one of the sort of the only uh, you know, a liberation fighter who actually focused on these questions that are, that are still with us today, 100 years later? Actually, there was quite a number of uh, the great figures in the freedom movement who had a strong spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Perhaps Shurabindo is outstanding in that way, mm -hmm. but Tilak certainly had a spiritual life. We can't forget Gandhi himself. Right. There was a great number of Dipin Chandra Pal, all in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, I think Sri Aurobindo was the one who, having left the freedom movement, and he did leave it, went farthest along the spiritual path. And right. so nowadays, he's remembered in India perhaps more as a spiritual figure than as a revolutionary and a politician. Mm -hmm. His polit political career was very short, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. He entered uh, public politics in 1906, and he left it in 1910. Mm -hmm. He was working behind the scenes from around 1902. Mm -hmm. But uh, however you, you want to say, uh, 
eight years is not a terribly long time for someone to have been a participant. And the fact that he left when he was in his prime has always um, sort of cast a shadow uh, over his political career because people who were caught up in it, even say Nehru himself, said that people at the time wondered, well, why did he leave us now? Um, he left because he heard a higher call. I see. And I think uh, when people saw what he did with his, his spiritual development, the books that he wrote, the ashram that he founded, uh, the many people that he guided, the inspiration he provided for people around the world, that sort of uh, retrospectively uh, justified in people's eyes what he had done, so that by the time he passed away in 1950, there was an enormous, enormous outpouring of public grief, even though he'd hardly been heard from for the last, for the previous 40 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so you became let, you became fascinated in Sri Aurobindo in the early 70s. You moved from Chicago. Actually, a bit earlier than that. Earlier than that. Um, okay. Well, I was going to college uh, out in Ohio in um, 66, 67. Incidentally, I was born in Chicago, I but I grew up in the Philadelphia area. I see. And um, later kind of settled in New York. Um, so uh, having read about... Uh, Indian spirituality in general, learning about yoga. This was a time when that first wave of interest in Indian spirituality hit America. So I got, I guess you could say, caught up in that. Mm -hmm. um, I was drawn very quickly to Sri Aurobindo and, and um, after having studied and attempted to practice his yoga in New York for a few years, Mm -hmm. I decided in 71 that it would be time to see what Pondicherry would like, what this ashram was like. And so, so, um, so that's, when, that's you when I came. That's when you moved there and uh, you actually started the archives uh, from, for, you know, from, this, from sort of the ground up, actually. You actually put the papers well, together. Well, the archives, we, uh, a group of us started the archives from okay. the ground up. A very, um, a man with a lot of Forethought, who had been uh, a direct disciple of Sri Aurobindo named Jayantilal Pare, mm -hmm. was the one who got the idea. He needed some people to carry out his ideas. Mm -hmm. And I was the first one who wandered in, you might say. I see. And um, So you, you started out as a time. devotee. So you started out as a devotee, and then you became an archivist and a historian. And are you are you still a well, devotee? Well, those are those are all labels. Did it? I just came. I said I, I want to find out what this uh, place was like. I was attempting to practice the yoga. Okay. Um, devotee, if you like the term, um, that's the term. Unfortunately, that's been uh, picked up by the people who have started the movement against me and against the ashram. I see. Okay. So I I, I kind of keep that term at, at arm's length, but it would apply to me in, um, in a way that makes sense to me, okay. if not to others. Right. Um, so yeah, I came as someone who wanted to practice yoga, who was inspired by Sri Aurobindo, and was given this work. And uh, it appealed to me. Um, I was fascinated by Sri Aurobindo, all aspects of, of Sri Aurobindo. But you've written like, you written like 10 books. You've, you've, written, you've been a, quite yeah. a prodigious scholar. That's true. Well, um, after a certain point, the same gentleman who had given me work in the archives, uh, what would, in the beginning we didn't even call it the archives. It, it, we, we adopted that name two or three years down the line. At any rate, um, he sort of encouraged me to go to archives, uh, public archives, around the country and later around the world and gather material. And um, later, um, there was a, a, a book, a textbook contest. I entered that. I won a prize. I published that book and uh, began to think, well, now I have all this uh, data on Sri Aurobindo. I've been organizing it and um, trying to figure out the best way to present it. So I thought, well, maybe uh, now is the time to start writing books. 
So while remaining part of the archives office, doing work, the sort of work we do uh, of um, preparing material for publication, uh, arranging the uh, materials themselves, the, the notebooks and papers of Shurabindo, I began to take time off and write books essentially as part of my work for the archive, but on my own responsibility. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, because I read your brief biography of Aurobindo like almost 20 years ago in a, uh, in, in a seminar that I took on mysticism uh, years ago at the University of Chicago. And of course, I was fascinated by the biography and, and even went through the collection of archives that the Regenstein Library at the time had. Uh, that would that would come in these bind you know by Indian sort of binded uh, uh, you know uh, uh, right, cardboard I, I, I know they, they, you know, they were bound kind yeah. of hand bound kind of cardboard uh, uh, binders yeah. that would come in and you know I was quite fascinated by by the work and of course so it's quite a, quite an honor for me to now meet you uh, by a Skype <laughs> um, so so tell me now what is the controversy I mean I've looked online there are like twenty pages of of texts that that uh, that are presented online, that are disputed mm -hmm. or have questions about that people have questions about, and obviously we can't cover everything. So one of them is the fact that there was potentially some sort of a relationship between Mira Elfasa Richards and Sri Aurobindo, uh, which was of you know a human relationship as opposed to just a, a spiritual relationship. Is that is that right? Sure. There was a relationship between them. Okay. It was fundamentally spiritual. Okay. But um, they also met on a human level. Okay. That's, that's something certain. I think people were looking for passages, I'm sure, people were looking for passages that could be misrepresented and used to arouse uh, agitation, passion, discontent, and um, it was a strategy that worked terribly well. Okay, but you, you don't say in if the book you, anywhere that I could find, or at least in the notes online, is that, they, you know, that there was any kind of a sexual relationship between Sri Aurobindo or, or the mother. Of course there wasn't. There wasn't? Yes, there wasn't, but yeah. not in the least. Okay. And I even say explicitly that they both, um, um, they'd both been married. We don't know much about their marriage, marriages. Right. They've both been married, she to, to a man and, and he to, to a, a right. young woman. Right. Um, they were way past that by the time they met, and they were both deeply into the spiritual uh, 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 right. uh, flowering that, that, that uh, uh, would, would take them to, to a level far, far beyond I see. anything, any... Uh, petty human level, but they remain human beings. Right, right. And um, to me, the fact of that tender human side added greatly to the richness mm -hmm. of their relationship. Right. And so while um, that famous passage, is, is, um, which is quoted in, and quoted again and again, is maybe a couple of sentences that is sort of an anecdotal introduction mm -hmm. to a somewhat technical discussion of the concept of uh, Ishwara Shakti, Purusha Prakriti, the uh, male and female principle coming together. Mm -hmm. And there, citing them, I made it perfectly clear that on that level, that there was nothing of ordinary human attachment and they both um, said uh, that had there been any such thing the spiritual um, upliftment that they got from one another wouldn't have worked I see okay so um, there was really there, you have to I assume somewhat foolishly I suppose that people would read not one paragraph but the three pages that that paragraph mm -hmm. belonged to mm -hmm. there's a section in the book that I sort of cover that but okay. people got hung up. And don't forget, the book is not yet published in India. Nobody has copies of the book. I what see. people have are copies of those 20 pages I see. that were sent out, mass emailings, um, you know, printed up, passed around, 
they're um, terribly, terribly decontextualized. I see. And the uh, compiler of those things actually admitted mm -hmm. that he did it uh, not to present a balanced view of the book, but just, um, I could send you the link, but um, something like, we wanted to show the worst that there was in the book because we had to prevent its coming publication. We heard it was going to be published in a couple of months, and we had to get something started. I see. And so, of course, the, the, that one little aspect is what now people are fixing on. It mm -hmm. was only you know, part of the 20 pages. But it turned out to be the one that got the biggest bonus. I see. That so, so now let's let's yeah. talk about the yeah. Sri Arbindo's relationship. You know, there are a couple of things that I'm quite curious about. His relationship with his mother, uh, yeah. Sri Arbindo's mother. You know, it, it, I think it's well documented, um, or, or there is enough evidence to suggest that clearly she had a psychiatric condition of some sort. Uh, Certainly, she did. What's that? Yes, that's true. Okay. And, and of course, you know, there, there, there are episodes in other biographies as well, or hagiographies, if you will, that, uh, that, he, that he was potentially scarred by the lack of maternal affection. Uh, that, I don't know. We, okay. In my own book, I sort of speculate on that, but the only documentation I could get was from a letter written by his brother. We really don't know. And there's, at, at least speaking as a biographer, and therefore a person who bases his conclusion on documents, we really don't know how Sri related to his, his, his mother's condition. He um, looked after her for her whole life. He, he set apart a good um, portion of his salary at Baroda mm -hmm. to keep her in a, in a house in uh, Bihar where she was living. I see. He was the one of the, his, his uh, brothers who did this. I see. He had a kind of attachment to her, I'm sure, but there was no, when he came back from England at the age of 22, right. after having been gone for a good 14 years, she couldn't even recognize him. So right. clearly we don't have a normal uh, mother-son relationship, and don't forget that he went abroad when he was seven. Right, no, no, but he went so, to Darjeeling before, right, at the age of five. That's true. Right, so, so he goes to uh, a boarding school, didn't have, right, he goes to a boarding school at the age of five, and then from the boarding school he's sent to the UK uh, to study right. for almost right. uh, throughout his childhood. That's right. Right, so he really doesn't have, you know, what, what you would say, a kind of, a, you know, a normative, well, you know, in those days, what was normative? We, we can't contextualize it historically. Right. You know, childhood is one right. of those compl and complicated... And especially in India, where the mother-son relationship is so strong. And Bengal, of, of all places, happened. right? And in Bengal, right. Right. So, so he doesn't so, have that kind of, what, you know, what paradigmatically we might call a loving, affectionate, doting kind of relationship that extends throughout his childhood because his father wants to send him to Darjeeling and then ships the brothers off to England to study, right? And they're staying with, um, uh, at, at the house of a clergyman in London. That's right. And you describe in, in, in some detail, never before disclosed, how their conditions of upbringing were in England because the father didn't send them enough money. No, he didn't. And they were, they were literally living off of what? Cereal and rice and, and sometimes going hungry. Yeah. That's, that's true. There was a period where they had virtually nothing. Correct. And then, as you obviously, you know, the narrative, I think, to Indians is well known, maybe not so much to Westerners. And then, of course, he, was, he, he passes all the exams for the civil service test, but does not show up for the writing test. Um, right. And his father passes away uh, because of a... Just before he returns. Just beca before he returns because he, he's misinformed that somehow the ship that's carrying Sri Aurobindo back to India has, has uh, gone down. Well, that um, little episode has been somewhat romanticized, but it's true okay. that um, there was some... some um, uh, he was waiting for his son to come back and was disappointed that he didn't. I see. Then there's a scene where 
we we learn from uh, a neighbor that um, he was in a very uh, depressed mood. He came back from Bombay. He was in a depressed mood, um, and then suddenly uh, was found dead. Hmm. So um, there, if I documented that using what contemporary sources there were, the it's one of several episodes where. Um, I think it was given some imaginative coloring in mm -hmm. early uh, accounts, mm -hmm. early biographical accounts. But yeah, something like that happened, and he certainly, there's no question that Sri was strongly influenced by his father, and there's no doubt that he felt his father's early death uh, very strongly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now... Shifting a little bit, I mean, I could go into multiple directions here with the interview, but but shifting a little bit. So, what do you think is the big contribution that Sri Aurobindo made to the synthesis of East and West, integral yoga? You know, the, the idea of the descent of the overmind or the supermind into human consciousness. Can you talk about that a little bit? Like, what is his big, or is it, or is this idea of spiritual evolution that you talk about in the book? Um, you've hit on a number of uh, important points. I think to bring them together, one can say that on the one side, Sri Binda was a Vedantin. And for him, as for all Vedantins, the experience of the Atman, the Self, was fundamental. And uh, typically, especially in Advaita Vedanta, the experience of the self, the um, singular self, mm -hmm. ekam evadvitya, um, that sometimes leads to a withdrawal from the world. Why get involved in the world that, after all, is maya? So, in his own personal trajectory, Sri Aurobindo um, had this experience of the self was, was uh, completely absorbed in it, and yet emerged, and um, he was at that time uh, leading the revolutionary movement, the political movement. He emerged from this experience and went right back to work. And we can sort of take that as, as a symbol of what his yoga is all about, that you have this, um, uh, you can have this tremendous experience of, uh, solitary selfhood, kevalam, and yet at the same time be able to do work in the world. And this is how he read the Gita, the message of the Gita, and this is how he read the message of the Ishopanishad. So that's in his, um, say, pre-1914 sadhana, mm -hmm. he was sort of exploring how he, what he could do with that. Mm -hmm. And then he began to move uh, in his inner uh, motion mm -hmm. uh, upwards into a higher than mental level, as he described it, mm -hmm. which somehow provided a link between the lower triple world. Mm -hmm. mind, life, and body, and the action that takes place there, I see. and the upper triple world of Sat, Chit, and Ananda. Right. So for him, the big thing was this pivotal, um, supermental level between the two, and his uh, attempt was to kind of seize hold of this supermind and bring it down into himself and rise up into it in a way to make it accessible to humans. I see. Now, that's all pretty abstract, right? And, and um, um, what it's, it's uh, difficult, I think, for any of us truly to understand it, but it allowed um, him to find a way out of a kind of narrow Advaita mm -hmm. into one that opened up into uh, the, the wider um, work of creation and, okay, Two, that creation he saw in terms of evolution. I now see. we're okay. at the end of the 19th century, the early 20th century. Right. The uh, great idea right. of that period, of 
course, was the theory of evolution. Right. And many people were trying to use that theory as a way to link the world below and the world that was governed by science right. with something beyond. And he didn't see um, evolution in Darwinian terms. He definitely saw it as something that led beyond and into a higher realm. And that's then what he was trying to, to say participate in. Right. Now, and of course, the transpersonal Kenya. and kind yeah. of the new age you know, movement has credited Aurobindo, uh, I think rightly, for one of the early kind of forerunners of this idea. Uh, you know, if you read Wilbur and others, Ken Wilbur and others, you clearly see Aurobindo credited rightly for coming up with this idea of, of uh, you know, spiritual evolution or creative evolution, if you will, you know, the dated idea from Bergeson and others. So clearly you, you would, you know, I think you say in the book that Aurobindo was struggling with some of the big ideas of the 20th century in, in some respects. Right. Although he would say that he wasn't struggling with the ideas, but right. he was opening to the experience of them and trying to right. embody them. Fascinating. So while he was yeah. a great philosopher and he wrote a big fat book of philosophy called The Life Divine, right. in which all of this is set out in great detail, right. he would um, say distinguish himself from a Bergson or from an Alexander right. who worked out a, a strictly intellectual theory of spiritual evolution. And he would say that um, it was something that was happening. Right. Okay. It, it, and that he was trying to, to hook up with it. Right. And he got was it, got trying it. not just to okay. Fascinating. So I have to ask you, what happened in Alipur jail when, uh, when Sri Aurobindo is charged with sedition and, and for a year or longer, he's there in seclusion and isolation and he has a breakthrough uh, at that time in terms of, uh, you know, reaching a level of consciousness, because, partly because of seclusion. But do you find in your research that he actually had a, a, an experience, uh, like a breakthrough experience in terms of, um, you know, consciousness raising kind of experience in, in the prison, in Alipur jail? Oh, definitely. Okay. Definitely. Um, he set out a series of four experiences as being like the great landmarks in his sadhana. The first was the experience of the, um, what he called uh, the silent Brahman. Let's say that's the Vedantic experience. He was totally absorbed in that. And as I said, um, he was, was um, running a revolution at the time. Mm -hmm. So um, he had to sort of, well, it so happened that he was drawn out from that and continued the work, but he didn't have so much time for his sadhana, because he was in the midst of this, this political maelstrom. Uh, what happened was when he got arrested and tossed into jail, he had plenty of time to meditate, obviously. Mm -hmm. And that's when his sadhana took a turn. And the first experience he had was strictly impersonal. Um, let's just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. The second experience that came, in, came to him in the jail was the experience of the personal divine, which he saw as in the form of Krishna. Mm -hmm. So here we had the personal and the impersonal, or the impersonal and the personal combined in his sadhana. And the rest was sort of a working out of that. So the, um, uh, the others uh, that followed, the other two, had to do with this rising to higher level. Got it. That that um, uh, led to the supermind. Mm -hmm. The kind of uh, pivotal experience was to see, not to see that the impersonal Brahman and the uh, personal divine were aspects of the same thing. Got so it. he spoke of a Purushottama experience. Fascinating and book. That fascinating book, okay. Peter. It's a fascinating, uh, you know, uh, chronology, history, biography that you've put together here. We're unfortunately we're out of time. We could talk about wow. this endlessly, you know, without any concern for time. But, uh, you know, given we live in this human reality, we have to be bound by time. 
so, but I hope to continue this conversation. Uh, I understand you're going to be on the East Coast possibly sometime in the near future. So we'd love to have you uh, again and continue this dialogue with you about the, live, the, lives, the lives of Sri Aurobindo, as the book is called. Um, so I, I, I thank you again, and I thank our viewers for tuning in to this fascinating discussion about one of the most important Indian philosophers of the 20th century, a mystic, a revolutionary, and clearly a landmark figure, not only in the Indian national struggle, but I would say even today, as East and West uh, is trying to reach a greater level of confluence and congruence, uh, culturally, economically, geopolitically, uh, and the like. So thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thanks, Appreciate it. Thank you.